one. At the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, seven-year-old Zoe Battolini spends her school holidays battling the mucus that constantly threatens to clog her lungs. <coughs> so Zoe, do you know why you have to come into hospital so much? Because I have cystic fibrosis. And do you, do you understand what that is? Sort of. Pretty complicated, probably, yeah? Yeah. Zoe's doctors understand precisely what causes cystic fibrosis. In every cell of her body, she has a pair of faulty genes, one inherited from each of her parents. The mutations that cause cystic fibrosis and dozens of other diseases are now routinely diagnosed in genetic testing labs. But money to pay for the tests is scarce. And now this man wants a slice of it. For his shareholders in Australia, and soon, he hopes, for investors in New York. We have a range of interesting opportunities to bring to the market, and from an investor point of view, it looks like there could be considerable upside. His Melbourne-based company holds controversial patents, which it claims are being infringed by almost every laboratory worldwide that's testing for inherited diseases. And he's begun his campaign to cash in. Very large licence fees, uh, such as you've mentioned, would blow our clinical and laboratory program out of the water. I think what we're doing is wonderful. I, I have a difficult time understanding why people would stop to criticise. Last month, the 19th International Congress of Genetics met in Melbourne. As the biotechnology revolution roars ahead, it offers better health for many and growing wealth for some. But can one of those goals conflict with the other? Tonight on Four Corners, a global patent system that's given one small Australian company astonishing power. It can effectively choose who studies our genes and how much they should pay for the privilege. The welcoming ceremony at the Genetics Congress reminded a roomful of molecular biologists that other folk have other ways of accounting for the creation of life on Earth. The politicians in attendance were dreaming of the creation of wealth. It's certainly our view in this state that biotechnology will underpin the new technologies, the industries and many of the jobs of the 21st century. In Australia and worldwide, even publicly funded researchers are being urged to keep their eyes on the prize the commercial exploitation of their remarkable discoveries. But many in this distinguished audience were uneasy. There's always a tension between those who would like to garner wealth, and they contribute a lot to society. There's also those who say, I believe in the common good and I want that to be enlarged, and they contribute a lot to society. The tension, the debate between these two views is extremely important to our progress. And I quote again, There's no better example of that productive tension than the effort to sequence the human genome. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Francis Collins. The charismatic Dr. Francis Collins led a publicly funded international effort in fierce competition with a private American corporation. The sequence of your instruction book and mine reached its final completed state and was placed on the internet freely accessible for anybody with a good idea to help us figure out how it works to begin that next phase. Hooray for that. We did it. That night, the star of the Congress delighted his audience with his tribute to the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the double helix structure of DNA. Happy birthday.
But the next morning, Collins would strike a more controversial note, which soon became the talk of the Congress. He publicly attacked a Melbourne biotechnology company for its aggressive enforcement of patents that cover vast tracts of the genome of every creature on Earth. The real question, it seems to me, is this good for the public? If pursuing an aggressive stance with this patent slows down the progress of scientific research, then the public is injured, and you and I should object. The identity of Francis Collins' target is no secret. Dr. Mervyn Jacobson, founder and executive chairman of Genetic Technologies Limited of Melbourne. But Jacobson wasn't in Melbourne for the Congress. He was jetting around America, enforcing his patents and hunting up new investors. On the Australian Stock Exchange, Genetic Technologies, or GTG in stock market parlance, is the toast of its investors. It has tripled its share price in the past four months. Now Jacobson is hoping to tap into the huge pool of venture capital available in New York. We simply tell them how we were formed, what we've achieved, what technology we have, our growth plans, and from their point of view, I imagine they see that this is a company that's significantly undervalued at the moment, and from an investor point of view, it looks like there could be considerable upside. But to his critics, GTG's broad-ranging patents and the way Dr. Jacobson is trying to exploit them typify the downside of the drive for biotechnology profits. Because it's going to be obviously extremely destructive. It's going to prevent a lot of important work in healthcare and indeed wealth creation for it at large. It's not even going to benefit Australia, I think, if this patent continues to rise. I think the chances that I'll be challenged somewhere are very, very high. Um, simply because, unlike other patents, this one, whatever its validity in terms of inventiveness, claims provenance over 98% of the human genome. And not just the human genome, the bovine genome, the eucalyptus genome, any genome. Birds do it, bees do it, even educated fleas do it, let's do it. Let's fall in love in Spain. Every creature on Earth more sophisticated than a bacterium keeps its gene pool stirring through sexual reproduction. And access to 95% of the DNA of all those organisms is covered by patents owned by genetic technologies. Let's. The man whose research in the 1980s gave rise to the patents no longer has any connection with Mervyn Jacobson or genetic technologies. But Dr. Malcolm Simons is still fiercely proud of his scientific achievements. He's also a very sick man. The sad bit, I guess, of this story is Malcolm here now has cancer. Very good thing to come in today and uh, just have had some pretty serious chemotherapy. Malcolm Simons came to the Melbourne Genetics Congress for the launch of an ABC Catalyst program that celebrated his invention. It was called The Genius of Junk. There would be some distinguished faces in the audience. Sir John Sulston, for example, Nobel laureate and leader of Britain's contribution to the Human Genome Project. DNA. Within its exquisite structure lie the clues to our destiny. How we are formed, how we will live, and how we may die. The Catalyst program explained that our active genes constitute only a small fraction of our DNA. And even within each gene, only specific sections actually code for proteins, the building blocks of life. All the rest, the other 95%, was assumed to be genetic gibberish with no known function. So they called it non-coding or junk DNA. Malcolm Simons, a New Zealand-born immunologist, not a geneticist, claims to have been the first scientist to realize 
that